All right, well, let's get started. Welcome, everybody. I want to welcome Dr. Heather Hirsch back for part two of Thriving in Menopause in 2020. For those of you who are lucky enough to see part one, you know that Dr. Hirsch is a nationally renowned expert in women's health and the director of midlife and menopause at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And Brigham and Women's Hospital very smartly recruited her here from Ohio, where she had a very thriving practice. And now, we're so lucky to have her here with us at the Brigham and even luckier to have us here for part two of her webinar. So we'll do it similar to last time, which is that if you have questions, you can address them to us in the chat as a group chat. And if for whatever reason you'd prefer to send it to me or Dr. Kelly Hedgepath, it would be anonymous and we will pose those questions. We're going to screen them, collect them, and pose them to Dr. Hirsch at the end. So please throw questions at us throughout and we'll save them up for the end. And without further ado, Dr. Hirsch, welcome back, and thank you so much for joining us. Great. Thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay and you can see my slides. It should say thank you. Okay. So picking up from where we were last, uh, the first part of this webinar, we broke it up into two because there is just so much to talk about when we're thinking about midlife and women's health. So just to remind you, or if you weren't there, the first part of this, we talked a lot about normal menopause, definitions of menopause, surgical menopause, natural menopause, early menopause. We talked a little bit about treatment with non-hormonal options, and we also talked about the timing hypothesis to use hormone therapy if you had symptoms of night sweats, um, night awakenings, etc. And so we talked a little bit about that. Today we're going to be talking about three big things. Bone health, we're going to be talking about vaginal health, and we're going to be talking about some sexual health. And if there's there should be a little bit more time at the end this time just because you know I'd be happy to take questions on anything menopause related whether it was this lecture or the last lecture so let's go ahead and jump in and I know I have a tendency to talk so I'm going to be watching on my um, watch for the time so I thought we would start with some bone health now bones are extremely important bone health is often like some or many women's health issues often overlooked, or unfortunately, it's something that we screen for, in my opinion, too late. And so I did want to spend a little bit of time with bone health. Now, more women will suffer from an osteoporotic fracture than they will from a heart attack, stroke, and cancers combined. So for all of you who are cardiology uh, patients and cardiologists, you know, so much money is spent, billions and billions of dollars, in osteoporotic fractures. Now, you lose the most bone when you go through menopause. So there's, I always tell my patients, and for anyone who wants to hear, there's two kinds of cells uh, that build bone. There's something called your osteoblasts that build bone and your osteoclasts that break down bone. Account, and you're always putting money in and you're taking money out of your bank account, right? So there's always money going in and money coming out. And you can think about the same thing with your bones. It's constantly being built and it's constantly being broken down. But just like your bank account, you hope that at the end of the day, there's positive balance in there and not a negative balance. Once you get into osteoporosis, that's when we have a debt. That's when we have sort of a, a negative bank account. And similar with osteopenia, that's kind of when you get those alerts on your phone or from your bank account that you're, you're about to withdraw money or that your account's going low. That's kind of what I consider osteopenia. Now, estrogen helps to stop the osteoclast. So it actually stops those cells that break down the bone. And that's why estrogen really helps to keep bone really healthy. So women lose a significant amount of their bone density after menopause when they no longer make any estrogen. In fact, one of my thoughts has always been since men make a steady state of estrogen their whole lives and the estrogen is therefore protective at their bones, that may be one reason why men are less prone to uh, bone density losses like osteopenia and osteoporosis compared to women. 
Now, a bone density calibrates how strong your bones are, how dense they are. So if you think of a sponge, how many holes are in it? So a lot of times, osteoporosis gets confused with osteoarthritis. So when I am talking to a woman about getting a bone density, and she may be on the fence, but she says, yeah, my hips really hurt, maybe I should. Your bone density actually has very little to do with any aches and pains that you have. It's just a sheer measure of how dense your, bone are, your bones are, which therefore translates into how much of a risk do you have if you fall from a standing height? If your bones are very dense, your risk is low. If your bones are not so dense, the risk is, is much higher that you will fracture it. A bone density scan is not painful. It's about 10 to 15 minutes in open scanner. And fun fact, you're not supposed to wear a deodorant the day that you get your bone density. So risk factors for osteopenia, which is the precursor in osteoporosis, are definitely hormonal, so especially menopause, right? We just kind of said when you lose your estrogen at menopause, that can hurt your bones because estrogen plays a role in keeping your bones strong and stopping the, the cells that break down your bones. Particularly early menopause and surgical menopause, it is the gold standard to get a bone density a few years after your menopause. In fact, the for internists, we tend to follow the USPSTF guidelines, the United States Task Force guidelines which say that if you don't have a risk factor for osteoporosis, you should get your first bone density test at age 65. To me, that's about 15 years after the average age of menopause. And I can almost always find a secondary risk that a woman will have so that they can get a bone density within a few years after menopause. So if you have had a bone density, kudos. If you haven't, and it has been a few years, I'm going to go through some uh, secondary risk factors that could uh, help you think about and your doctors think about getting you a bone density. Anything, any type of family history. So if your mom had osteoporosis, if a sister has osteoporosis, if a, if your if your parent, you know, your father also had osteoporosis, family uh, family. Um, History is a risk factor. Any type of malabsorption issues, whether it's celiacs, whether it's Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, any type of malabsorption disorders, that's a reason you can get a bone density. Thyroid disorders, hypo or hyperthyroidism, certain medications, so especially anti-seizure medications or other types of uh, medications can definitely um, predispose you to osteoporosis and osteoporosis, and so that can be a secondary a risk for bone loss. Uh, also lifestyle causes. So smoking and alcohol use and actually being slender increase your risk for um, be, uh, bone um, low bone density. Um, about being, the only thing being slender is a risk factor is for, is for osteope, osteopenia and osteoporosis. Otherwise, you know, having a low BMI is typically helpful. But there are many more secondary causes. These is not the full list. But again, I say this because I want you to feel proactive if you haven't had a bone density yet and it's been a couple years after menopause, it might be a good time to do it. Now, the way we look at uh, bones is by measuring your T-score. Now, uh, your bone density, if you get one back, will have a T-score and a Z-score. And it's not that exciting. All you want to know is the Z-score is for when clinicians order a bone density on someone who is pre-menopausal. So if you're postmenopausal, you're just looking at your T-score. You would do a Z-score if you were looking at someone who had an eating disorder um, or some other type of Crohn's or steroid use. Steroid use actually is a big secondary cause. I should have mentioned that in the last slide. Sometimes we do order bone densities on women who are not menopausal and we're looking at the Z-score. So menopausal women, T-score. So a, a T-score of negative 1.1 to negative 2.4 is osteopenia. Osteopenia, in my opinion, is really important, and you should take this diagnosis seriously. Many people, in fact, clinicians tell me their patients taking vitamin D or calcium for their osteopenia. And I really want to stress that my opinion is that vitamin D and calcium should be taken for all women. And it's not necessarily sufficient for osteopenia. 
So there are treatment options for osteopenia. And because this is a whole lecture just on bone health, I'm just gonna sort of briefly list them for you to consider. But you can take estrogen for treatment of osteopenia. It's FDA approved for osteopenia alone without any other symptoms. There are also bisphosphonates that you can take. Um, and those are once weekly medications. And there's also something, there's also an IV form of a bisphosphonate that you take every two years. And so I say this just because if you've had a conversation about osteopenia before and you felt like it was just kind of like, oh, you know, it's fine, just take your vitamin D. I really want to stress that sometimes, especially if you have other risk factors, if your bone density is closer to that negative 2.4 range, you might want to consider some other, some other treatment. Uh, you know, sometimes estrogen is also helpful if you do have other symptoms of menopause, which is sort of the bigger thing that we're talking about here. Osteoporosis is when you have a T-score of less than negative 2.5. Um, and there are different treatment options for um, osteoporosis. Estrogen is not FDA approved for osteoporosis. It's really a preventive, it's really FDA approved only for osteopenia. Once you get into osteoporosis range, that debt, when I was talking about thinking about it like your bank account, you're really in a lot of debt and you really do need a bone building medication. There's many bone building, bone building, building medications, including those bisphosphonates. Again, there's also IV medications and there's injectables, medic, injectables like um, a sub, a sub subcutaneous injection that you get every six months, that's called Prolia. And then there are injections that you can give yourself daily that you do for 18 to 24 months. So I don't wanna to get too deep into the treatment, but I do want you to know there's a vast range of treatment options for osteopenia. Now, somebody once gave me this really great imagery and they, they took uh, osteoporosis treatment uh, like building a house. So, if you're gonna build a brand new house, you're gonna need lots of supplies. You're gonna need wood, you're gonna need windows and doors and you know, all the other things that you need to build a house. And I think of calcium and vitamin D as those building blocks. But calcium and vitamin D or the wood and the doors, they're not gonna build the house themselves, right? You need the contractor, you need the building, the, the builders, you need the, the men to do the heavy lifting. And that's where a bone medication, if you already have, if you have osteoporosis, really comes into play. So a lot of people, I, I have this conversation a lot, and I do treat osteopenia and osteoporosis as well in my menopause and midlife clinic. And, uh, you know, there are endocrinologists, those are the, you know, uh, doctors who can also treat osteopenia and osteoporosis, but I have this conversation quite often. So um, there are medications for both osteopenia and osteoporosis, and all women should be taking calcium, 1,200 milligrams, and vitamin D, 1,000 to 2,000 units a day. Now, before I move on, because I, I want to really mention that this important point, that your bone density is actually just a surrogate marker, meaning many women are also diagnosed with osteoporosis after they've had a fracture. So in the last slide, I said, if you sustain a fracture from a non-traumatic event, for example, you were just walking outside and you, um, you know, broke off your, your limbs are a little different, different. So toes and things like that are a little different, but you just sort of broke your foot or you were sitting at your doctor's exam table and you fell off that exam table for some reason and you broke a spine or you broke a hip. Those are considered osteoporotic fractures. They're non-traumatic. You weren't in a car accident, but you, and normally uh, if you didn't have such low bone density, you probably would not have broken a, a bone. But those defining moments give you the diagnosis immediately of osteoporosis because it's actually a clinical diagnosis. Bone density is just a marker. There's also something called the FRACs and other risk assessment scores that you can talk about with your doctor to do your very best to guess your risk. So bone density is important, but again, it's only one marker. So education is really powerful and prevention is really, is really important when we're thinking about bone health. So what do you do for strong bones? Um, for those of you who are scrambling to ask me again what the, what the um, recommendations for vitamin and calcium are, here they are. So vitamin D, 1,000 to 2,000 units a day, up to 5,000 units a day is absolutely fine. In fact, I um, 
I myself, I purchased the 5,000 units a day because inevitably I miss a night or two. And so, you know, on average, I'm getting about 2,000 units of vitamin D a day, especially in the winter time when we're not getting any vitamin D from sunlight. Vitamin D is really best from supplement. And in terms of foods, there's just simply not enough in foods. So you really want to spend the money to get your vitamin D over the counter. I think we talked a little bit about this. I uh, stress the importance of these last, last webinar. Calcium, 1,200 milligrams a day is optimal, and the best way to get it is through food, if you can. That way your kidneys will cycle out any type of extra calcium that you may be eating. Um, but if you're really just not a calcium, you know, you don't really do a lot of dairy or don't supplement with almond milk or coconut milk or any other types of foods that have calcium, you only need 1,200 milligrams a day. Weight-bearing exercise is helpful. So weight-bearing exercise, you know, if you've got those weights in your hands and you're doing a bicep curl, they're sort of telling those muscles that, that there's a stressor. And that stressor is sort of also sending those messages to your bones that they should be building to be really strong in case you need to run away from a bear or something, right? That's how our cave, our cave brains kind of help and help us function still. So weight-bearing activity can be helpful. If you already have osteopenia or osteoporosis, specifically osteoporosis, it is actually sometimes advisable to you do weight-bearing exercise with a trainer to make sure a lot of women will ask me, well, how will I know if I won't have a fracture doing weight training exercise on my own? So you could always include a trainer. And also uh, at the Brigham, we have physical therapy for osteoporosis. So you can also work with a physical therapist sort of along the same lines to teach you and make sure that some of the postures or things that you're doing are going to keep you from having a fracture just from exercising. Of course, avoid smoking and excessive alcohol intake. Those are going to weaken your bones. So again, I did talk about some treatment already. Uh, there's various, various options. And I just wanted to mention again, a lot of times clinicians and patients and women forget that estrogen can be used for osteopenia, um, but there's various other options. And so that's where a, a shared uh, decision-making and talk with your doctor is going to be really important. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on bone health. All right. Now let's get into sort of sexual health and uh, vaginal health. And, um, you know, their sexual health and menopause and midlife is, for many women, important. For women, many women, not important. And there's no right or wrong answer. You know, there is, there is really no right or wrong answer on if you should be sexually active. It's, 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 not, a, it's not a yes or no. There are a lot of vaginal changes that happen in menopause. And we started to touch a little bit upon this last webinar. We call these changes genitourinary syndrome of menopause, GSM for short. We used to just call it vaginal atrophy. But the reason they changed the name to genitourinary syndrome is because as clinicians, we realize that when you lose estrogen, it's not just the vagina that loses estrogen and the pH changes. It also includes the bladder and the urethra and, and, the, and, and thing, other things that are down in the lower GU tract. Vaginal changes, or GSM in general, that constellation of, you know, um, uh, either it's just dryness, it's pain with intercourse, it's frequent urinary tract infections, it's uh, sometimes burning or itching or irritating that's not a urinary tract infection, so those are all considered GSM, it is extraordinarily common. It is completely underdiagnosed and undertreated. Only a small percent of doctors will ask their patients about any symptoms in their vagina, any dryness. It up either due to time constraints or embarrassment, or again, simply societal's message that that's just what happens as you get older, and you know, there's nothing you can do about it. It's chronic and it's progressive, and unfortunately, it won't improve without treatment. So, we spent the first webinar talking a lot about hot flashes, and we have many receptors in our brain where estrogen typically binds, and when we lose our estrogen. Without that, it can trigger those receptors to be very angry and we can get hot flashes. But eventually, over time, for many women, 
on average, about five to seven years later, your brain will down-regulate those receptors. They'll just kind of stop making them. And your hot flashes do tend to go away. But unfortunately, in the vagina and in the genital urinary system in general, those receptors, you know, estrogen is a main has a main role in how those cells work. And so it's progressive. It's never going to go back to the way it was when you were premenopausal. This is a picture that says a thousand words. So, uh, and I show this picture to almost, almost all my patients and they say, yep, exactly. So if you can see my little blue area, a arrow, the healthy vagina has this pink plush healthy tissue. And you can see this right here. And these cells make things like moisture that help to lubricate it. They help make the vagina, you know, stretch and expandable. And, and as you get into uh, postmenopause vaginal atrophy land, the uh, vaginal lining becomes very thin, a pink, uh, a pale, um, it can bleed very easily and the elasticity decreases. Uh, the vaginal canal can also shorten. So you can see, not only would that make intercourse painful if you are sexually active, if you're not, it can still be painful even just with sitting or standing or walking. I'll have plenty of women tell me it feels like sandpaper. Um, and not only that, but it, because of the elevation in pH, it becomes more basic and therefore the bacteria are much more able to climb up to that climb up through that vagina and affect the bladder. And the bladder sort of is, this is a 3D rendering, but it would sort of be right on top of where your, um, your uterus is. So you've got your uterus and then your bladder. So if any of you are pregnant, you remember, actually wait, no, the other way around, <laughs> your bladder, your, 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 your uterus plus pressing on your bladder. So these genital urinary syndrome and menopause can, you know, be vaginal dryness, pain, and if there's dryness and pain and you choose or you'd like to be sexually active, this can change your libido, not only because hormonal, hormonally your libido has changed, but now it's painful. And so you don't have any desire, you wouldn't have any um, motivation to engage in sexual activity if it's painful, right? Absolutely not. It can increase urinary tract infections. And then, you know, of course, there can be some other issues from there. So these are some of the the medical terms. So hypoactive sexual desire disorder is just what it sounds like. It's a change in your libido that's bothersome to you um, that you would like to improve on. So a change in libido that's not bothersome to you is not a medical issue. If you don't ever want to have sex again and, and neither does your partner, then there's no issue. But if you do, or you do because you want to be with your partner and show them you love them and it's frustrating to you, that's called hypoactive sexual desire disorder or low, low libido for short. Dyspronia is painful intercourse. Um, then there can be problems with orgasm um, that can also happen postmenopausal arousal disorder again because of the decrease in lubrication. And vaginismus is that just um, the the tight tone in the vagina, the tightening of the muscles that say stay out. I I don't need to do that to survive, or I've already reproduced, or I'm no longer going to reproduce. So what kind of treatments are there? So there's over-the-counter options like moisturizers and lubricants. There's non-hormonal options and then there's hormonal options. And there is also a very select few medications for libido and for that sexual desire. So in terms of over-the-counter, I mentioned there's moisturizers and lubricants. And moisturizers and lubricants can be helpful. The, the one thing I always say to my patients is that they will not treat the underlying issue. They're not gonna treat the underlying problem. They're not gonna change the vaginal um, cellular layer. They're just gonna essentially kind of help when you use them with intercourse. Um, sometimes there can be chemicals in them that can actually be more irritating to women. And so it's something to think about. Another option that's, I guess, not medical and not hormonal is also pelvic floor physical therapy. Pelvic floor physical therapy is just what it sounds like, although you're not going to be seeing the same, the same person that's doing your elbow or doing your shoulder. Um, pelvic floor physical therapists are specially trained women who help um, with several things, uh, not just um, you know, painful intercourse by helping you learn to, to retrain your muscles, but also urinary issues as well. So while I'm not going to spend too much time talking about urinary leakage, that's a big thing I see in menopause and midlife, pelvic floor physical therapist is also a great way to work on retraining the muscles in the pelvic floor and those messages that go to your brain to retrain your brain 
to help you if you're having, you know, urge, um, urge incontinence, a little bit of stress incontinence. So, um, or, or, or sometimes even overactive bladder. So pelvic floor physical therapy takes sometimes women a little bit of time to wrap their mind around to see someone for that, but it's not as invasive as it sounds. And these are women who are specially trained in this type of field. So I wanted to first start with vaginal estrogen just because I do really want to highlight how safe and effective vaginal estrogen is. So again, vaginal, we talked about hormone therapy before and um, we were, I was talking about the systemic use of hormone therapy. So you take it orally or a patch or a gel and it goes all throughout your body. Vaginal estrogen is special in that it is just treatment for the lower GU tract. It doesn't go systemically. Therefore, there is absolutely no risk for breast cancers, strokes, cardiovascular incidences. Although the box will say that, and that's unfortunate, that is a political issue that many, when many, many, many women who are menopause experts, many physicians and healthcare advocates have tried to remove that black box warning. But again, there has been numerous long-term studies showing no, no link to recurrence of breast cancer, breast cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, or stroke when you're using vaginal estrogen. It can significantly improve someone's quality of life if the vaginal issues such as recurrent urinary tract infections or vaginal dryness or painful intercourse are affecting your quality of life. Remember, GSM is progressive and it is not going to get any better. In fact, it's probably just going to get worse as more time goes on. There's also, I really just want to say, significant uh, level one data, uh, level one research. Uh, that means it's been peer reviewed and other physicians, uh, uh, you know, collectively agree that estrogen can decrease the risk of recurrent urinary tract infections. So if this is you, vaginal estrogen is a really good option. There are also some non-hormonal options for genital urinary syndrome of menopause. The first on this list is a medication called parasterone. Parasterone is vaginal DHEA. DHEA is an androgen precursor. You can actually pick up DHEA over the counter at you know, Whole Foods um, or lots of vitamin supplement stores. It's just when you're making it vaginal, it's then a prescription. I will use parasterone for my patients who really don't want to take vaginal estrogen, um, who may be breast cancer survivors, sometimes even going through the end of their breast cancer treatment, the, the, the genital urinary tract is just so dry, there's so much pain, um, but they're, they're oncologists and they will feel comfortable with using parasterone. Or I have patients who simply just, just still don't want to take estrogen and parasterone is an option. And there's a medication called Ospemafem. Its brand name is Ospina. This is a nice option because this can be, this is an oral medication. So when we're thinking about vaginal estrogen treatments, a lot of women don't like that they're kind of messy, that you have to use them at night, and you know, you can forget them a lot. So Os Osfina is a good option. It's very underutilized. I actually do prescribe it quite frequently. So it's an oral option that you can use for, it's actually FDA approved for painful intercourse, but it definitely does help um, the tissue. And it, there is also good evidence to show that it helps bones as well. So if I have a patient with vaginal issues, um, painful intercourse, and a little bit of low bone mass, like in the osteopenia range, Osfina is a great option. So by no means do I think, you know, you guys should memorize any of these medications, but it's nice to know that there is options and that they exist. And one of the things I always advocate and say when I'm teaching residents and young doctors and my patients as well, is that there is no one size that fits all. And that's why it's hard to go through this even in two hours. So hypoactive sexual desire disorder, again, just to spend about, you know, 10 to 15 minutes on um, libido and, and sexual health, this can be really distressing for many women, uh, particularly if you're in menopause in midlife, if all of a sudden you're an empty nester again, uh, and if you have a partner that wants to be sexually active, but you don't, or your, you know, your sexual drives mismatch. So it's only called a hypoactive sexual desire disorder if it's low, if your libido is low and this is distressing to you. Um, and remember, 
at menopause or at midlife, your libido will change. The purpose of the sex drive is to reproduce. And after menopause, your ovaries have closed down shop and you, your brain sort of says, I don't need sex to, to survive. Like I need food, shelter, and water anymore. You know, maybe when you were younger, you, 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 you had a much higher libido because there was drive to reproduce. Um, and you also lose a little bit of your testosterone as well. At menopause and testosterone, it tends to be the hormone that does help or gives women some of their libido. Now, again, men have testosterone their whole lives. Their, horm their sex hormones never fluctuate. And uh, they have 10 times the amount of testosterone. And they never get pregnant. And they're always trying to reproduce. So they you know, have a little bit of a different trajectory, if you will, than women do. And explaining this to partners is always sometimes really helpful. Even if you have a female partner who is younger, again, the same thing, you can have different levels of libido. So there's a natural shift in libido at menopause that most women, but not all, but most women do experience. And then on top of that, if there's pain, if there's dryness, you know, again, you're moving even further away from the target. So, um, there are some options for sexual health that are over the counter. And uh, these are sort of on this list here, Angiomax, Strong Vivo, Zestra. These are actually fairly safe. Um, I have looked into them and researched them and they're, they're overall fairly safe. I just don't know if it's placebo effect or if they actually work. Uh, they can be costly though, so if you're spending you know, a lot of money on something and it's, it's not going to work. That's sort of unfortunate. Of course, there's always sex counseling and sex therapy. If it's not a libido issue, if it's a relationship issue, of course, that's always important. We want to stress that, that mental health aspect. So, you know, I think in the first webinar, I went over like the four pillars of health, which I think, um, your cardiologists all agree on, you know, diet, exercise, mental health, and sleep. And also just thinking about those. So that mental health aspect, if there's a relationship component, that's really important to think about. Um, if, there, if you're not sleeping, because you're not, if you're hot flashing, that's really important. Uh, very interestingly, a lot of my patients will tell me that they've simply gained too much weight and they don't feel comfortable or they don't feel you know, like themselves. And, and that can be a really big reason too. So, you know, there's many different reasons. Um, so what kind of medications can we take? Well, there's only two FDA approved options for sexual health. Um, um, and that is called fulbanserine and bromanolanotide. These are the two in the middle here. So let me go through this list really quickly. Bupropion's uh, brand or generic name is called Wellbutrin. Some of you may be taking Wellbutrin. Wellbutrin um, can often help women with a lot of things that are um, off-label. It's actually in the antidepressant class of medications. However, we use Wellbutrin off-label for so many things. Smoking cessation, weight loss, typically in the realm of about five to 10 pounds. Um, sometimes focus and energy and attention. It can be uh, first line for adult ADHD. Um, and also for sexual health. It actually sometimes helps with climax. So, you know, it's not all that, you know, but but again, it's something that can be tried. Flobanserine is also in the antidepressant class. Um, it is FDA approved for low libido. It's a once daily oral medication and is often quite expensive. So, you know, one of the things I face as a women's health provider is that um, access to uh, these medications can be sometimes really difficult because they can be expensive and it's completely unfair since men have about 75 plus medications for libido concerns and women only have two FDA approved options. Uh, bromanolanotide is a new medication and it is an injectable. Um, it's an as needed medication. So it's something uh, that you could use, say, before date night, um, and it helps increase arousal and desire. So, the, you know, a lot of my patients will say, is this like the female Viagra? Yes and no. It's not necessarily. In fact, Viagra doesn't even actually um, change your It simply causes erections, but these two medications um, improve arousal and desire. 
Testosterone is another option, and that is uh, also an off-label option. Um, again, sometimes just replacing testosterone can help women's libido. Um, testosterone, unfortunately, is not FDA approved in the United States and probably will not be within our lifetimes, and that's also political. Um, the role of, I actually have, um, you know, some videos on this that I've put on YouTube because this is a really important point that I don't want to spend way too much time on. Uh, but testosterone should really only be used for one indication, and that is, uh, especially when we're talking postmenopausal, and that should really be for low, low desire, low libido that is distressing. It's really not for muscle mass or for energy or for weight loss. There's no proof that it helps. Um, and we only recommend very, very small physiologic doses. So a very, very, very small percent of testosterone. And I typically will check this every six weeks and consistently make sure that it's not high. Um, and again, I, I actually only, you know, women usually are only getting levels, even what they would be you know, what they were getting postmenopausal or, or pre, sorry, premenopausal or less. Um, so I say this because there are a lot of women in wellness clinics um, who give women pellet injections of testosterone and whopping doses of testosterone, which are really uh, concerning. They can be very unsafe. Very high levels of testosterone can cause women to have balding, um, facial hair, um, acne that can leave permanent scarring, so permanent deepening of your voice and permanent enlargement of your clitoris. And so you definitely, definitely want to make sure if anyone uh, is getting testosterone, if it's you, if it's a friend, a family member, um, that it's uh, not in a really high dose. It's not in a pellet form. It's a very, very low topical gel almost. More about that if you really want to learn about that. So um, there is a lot to learn about uh, menopause in midlife. And, you know, thinking about what we talked about last time and this time, uh, not only is there a lot to know in, in so many different aspects of our bodies that are changing when we just lose our estrogen and a little bit of our testosterone, um, uh, but it's also something that's not often talked about or the dialogue is not freely flowing. And so that's why I think it's great that you guys have the opportunity to be at this webinar. Individualization, in my opinion, is so important because not one size fits all. And thinking about your past history, your top priorities, and where you want to be in, in your life, what's important to you, what risks you will assume, and what you want are really important. So no one size fits all. We talked a lot in the, in the first lecture about hormone therapy, and I think we'll have some time now to sort of go back and ask some more questions about hormone therapy, or I can always go back to some of those slides. But often the benefits of hormone therapy will outweigh the risks, particularly if you are taking a low-dose FDA-approved option of estrogen and or progesterone within 10 years of menopause. And most likely, the closer, the better. And again, your priorities really do matter. So if your priority is your bone health or your sexual health or, you know, your brain health or simply, you know, your hair or your weight, your priority is what's going to, is what should help a physician decide, um, what to really focus on. And of course, your other medical conditions really do matter because we want to make sure we're keeping the rest of you healthy. And in some ways, we want to prevent future, you know, issues like an osteoporotic fracture, your heart health, your brain, all of those things. Journaling is so important, and I talked about that a lot. And by journaling, I simply mean tracking your symptoms when they occur, um, what symptoms bother you. And that way, when you actually do go to talk to a doctor or a physician, you really have in front of you what's been going on the last couple of months, when things happen, and you can really easily see you know, what is most important to you. So again, the best options for you depend entirely on your priorities and your medical history and your surgical history. Um, you know, if you have had a hysterectomy, if you've had a blood clot after a surgery, all of those things that have happened specifically to you really make a big difference. Um, I did share, I think last time, some tools. If not, I'm gonna show them again. Um, I may have showed you guys um, 
uh, a website that I uh, always go to and show my patients. It's, it's um, menopause.org. And that's going to take you directly to the uh, governing body of menopause education in, here in the U.S., which is the North American Menopause Society. And there's a little button here called for women, and there's slides you can look at there. There's uh, position statements you can look at that, sh that will back up what I have been saying this webinar and last webinar. And there's also a little app that you can download for menopause symptoms. Um, it's called Menapro, um, and uh, you can use it either as a physician and or you can set it as a patient or a woman, and you can go through and it will kind of come up with some ideas um, for you for hormone therapy. But again, you know, no one size fits all, and and very oftentimes, if you don't like one thing, you can try another. So I've ended a little bit early here, and. I, I wanted to make sure that I didn't go too deep on one topic, that we have some time to sort of think back globally and answer some more of these questions that you guys might have. But menopause really does matter because uh, for women, there is uh, just, there's, there's real dangers that occur to women, unfortunately, because of the many myths and misconceptions about menopause and hormone therapy, about how long it lasts, about what is safe and what is efficacious. You guys may remember also, if you wanted to listen to any of my other um, social media free resources, there's my podcast, Women's Health by Heather Hirsch, and Health by Heather Hirsch on YouTube. I noticed that there's not an H there. There should be an H there. Um, so I'm going to... Um, Let's see, do I need to, I probably need to stop sharing my slides, but maybe I'll keep them on here in case we reference some, um, but the first webinar uh, slides and, and these slides are all still here. So why don't we start with going through any questions? So Heather, thank you so much. These are such important topics and you're right. We don't talk about them often enough and they affect so many of us. So there are a lot of questions that are coming up and there's a couple that I wanted to touch on. There's a lot of questions about vaginal estrogen, but before we get to that, do you have any uh, advice for people who develop insomnia at, after menopause, not related to hot flashes, but just the inability to get a really great night's sleep? Yes, yes. So that's a good topic is, uh, is sleep. So I always start with um, the basics. Um, if you are suffering from insomnia, start with a journal again. Journaling is really important because you want to tell your doctor what time are you going to bed? What time are you falling asleep? What time are you waking up? And about how many times in the night are you waking up? So you can do this by wearing like a Fitbit like I do and just start with journaling so that we know, is it trouble falling asleep? Is it trouble staying asleep? And sometimes you automatically know, but it's nice to sort of see how much sleep are you getting. The uh, goal is to get seven to nine hours of uninterrupted sleep. And we actually know that your lifespan decreases if you sleep less than that. Also more than that, but you know, seven to nine hours is the, is the goal. So after journaling, start with the basics on sleep hygiene, which is a cold room, 65 degrees or less. If your partner will allow you to colder, the colder the room, the better it's going to help you sleep. So it's summertime. So keep crank up those wall units, um, uh, a dark room, um, some ambient noise, a bedtime routine. So going to bed at the same time and waking up at the sleep time are really important. Sometimes a shower or a bath, which will change your body temperature can help you feel relaxed and fall asleep. But my number one sleep hygiene tip is remove the TV from your bedroom. So if anyone has a TV in their bedroom, remove it immediately. Not only is it distracting if you fall asleep with the TV on, but you're teaching yourself that when you're in bed, you hang out in bed. So you should only use your bed for sleeping and sex. So don't pay your bills in your bed. Don't talk on the phone in your bed. And definitely don't watch a movie in bed because again, you're teaching yourself that your bed is where you hang out. When you wake up in the middle of the night, the causes of that are can definitely be hormonal. Uh, a shift in hormones can cause you to wake up. Even if you're not sweating or your sheets aren't wet, women will wake up 1 a.m., 2 a.m. every night and then start worrying. So if this happens to you, there's a couple of things that you can do. Get up out of your bed. Remember, you want your bed to be the place that you associate with sleeping. So don't toss and turn in there. Get up, go to another room, sit in a chair and read a fiction book. You could even watch TV. TV is fine, um, but you don't want to have a tablet. You don't want to turn on your cell phone. Nothing that's got that blue light. After that, fiction books made you a little tired, get on back to bed. If your husband snores, the dog jumps in your bed, anything that you can remove that could wake you up at night, 
try to. I know that's easier said than done, um, but you really want to do your best to get a really good night's sleep. Um, so removing the TV from the bedroom. There are some sleeping medications, of course, that you can try after you've tried lifestyle. Sometimes progesterone at bedtime is one of the most subtle and effective ways to help sleep. Progesterone doesn't carry the same risks that estrogen does, but it's a nat natural relaxant medication, so progesterone is an option. And then sometimes there's things like trazodone that you can use. You really want to avoid benzo medications or benzo-like medications, which include Ambien and all of the Ambien-like medications, what they do is they cut off your central nervous system and they just put you out. And you might say, that's great. That's what I want. I want a good night's sleep. But the more you do that, the less you can learn how to get yourself to sleep and the more you are dependent on them. So journal, practice good sleep hygiene, practice a bedtime routine, get that TV out of the room, keep your bed for sleeping and sex only. And then if you need to talk to your doctor about medications, you know, you can. Oftentimes my patients will also use, or they're taking estrogen uh, for menopausal symptoms and that can really help as well. It just depends what you want to take. I know, long-winded answer, but that's something I could have put some slides in here on. So I'm glad you asked that. Awesome. And in fact, next week, uh, July 8th, Dr. Suzanne Bertish from Beth Israel, who's a neurologist who specializes in sleep disorders. She's going to do a whole hour on it. So, but this is great. A Good intro then for all of you listening. And uh, so, yeah, take those points. At, at, yeah. Wonderful. Um, Allison, did you want to come up with a question? And if not, I'm going to circle back to the vaginal estrogen one. Sure. So this is kind of along the lines of sleep because I get asked by patients all the time, what do I do when I'm getting up at night? to urinate so many times. Um, and sometimes that is directly related to those menopausal symptoms and the urinary symptoms might be a marker or something else. And sometimes it really is urinary frequency. So we would love your input on this. Great question. So you do want to actually try and stop drinking late at night. So I think we try to say cut off fluids around 5 or 6 p.m. I know sometimes that sounds absolutely undoable, but it's something that a a woman could try to see if that improves it. If she does that and that doesn't help, she's still waking up several times a night, it could be atrophy. You know, she should consider what is the cause of that nocturia. That's that word for waking up at night feeling like you have to pee. Again, journal is are you having a lot of pee or are you just feeling like you have to pee and it's just a dribble? Because that will make a difference. You could try vaginal estrogen. That might actually just keep the tissue healthy and keep you asleep. Wouldn't it be great if it was that simple? And then that will kind of uh, bridge into talking about vaginal estrogen. If, you know, not, if you're waking up, honestly, more than two to three times a night to pee, you should can talk to your doctor and maybe also a urologist. And a urologist is a great place to start. Doesn't mean they're just going to take you to surgery, but they're really going to get to the root cause of like, why are you having that recurrent symptom? It could be more than just, um, you know, having to pee. Great. Thank you. So for the vaginal estrogen, do you check blood levels to make sure it's not getting absorbed systemically in patients who are at high risk for breast cancer? Or we just know this from other data and, and someone was asking, do you have a reference, something people could read more about that, the safety of it? Yeah, I do. I have plenty of references and I'm happy to send them over to doc you, Dr. Lewis, and you can disseminate them. Great. Um, so I routinely don't, and that is because that hand is my, da that hand is my daughter. One, one second. Honey, can you go get Michelle? Okay, can you get Michelle, honey? I'll be right there. I'm sorry. We're dealing with children at home. Um, so um, routinely, I don't. And again, we uh, let me let me kind of take a step back. So I may have said this last last webinar, but if we go to if I went to you know the grocery store and it was post pre COVID and it was filled with people, and I asked all the postmenopausal women to get their blood levels checked of estrogen, their levels would come up anywhere between zero and twenty. So some people do make a tiny bit of estrogen postmenopausally, and we consider that zero to twenty postmenopausal ranges of estrogen. Um, for reference, if when you are premenopausal, your estrogen would go anywhere from about fifty to five hundred every month. Months, and when you're pregnant, it was up in the thousands. So zero to 20 is a pretty trivial, um, a, a very low amount of estrogen. When we do studies of vag vaginal estrogen usage in women who take it for, for various reasons, 
the levels inevitably are always somewhere between zero and 20. So they're still pretty consistently in that postmenopausal range on vaginal estrogen when we study it over and over and over again, that there really is no good indication to check it. Now, that being said, if a patient really wanted to check their estrogen levels, we absolutely could, and it would probably just confirm and reassure her. So it's never a, a never say never. We can, but I actually don't routinely check them when you're on vaginal estrogen. There was a really, really, really large epidemiology study that came Um, looking at decades of hormone therapy use, and, a, and mostly systemic, but a, a portion of that was also vaginal estrogen. And they found no associated risk of breast cancer or recurrence of breast cancer in vaginal estrogen. And this is one of the biggest studies of looking at vaginal estrogen use for like decades. Um, so, you know, we strongly, strongly, strongly feel just like hand lotion is going to stay on your hands when you use vaginal estrogen, it's going to stay primarily in the vagina. Great. Thank you. What about hair loss after menopause? Anything for that? Yes. So another significant concern after menopause. So great questions from your audience. Um, so hair loss is, is, is definitely common postmenopausal. We know that estrogen is really good for hair. So if any of you listening were ever pregnant, uh, and you remember maybe having, you know, that that sort of long hair or those long those nails, that type of Thing. estrogen is good for hair, skin, and nails. It's not its indication, but it definitely can help. So hair, typically postmenopausal, can start to thin. Women will find that when they take a shower, I will have many patients actually come to me and bring it in their baggie. You know, after I take a shower, this is how much hair is falling out. There is actually a definition. I think it's greater than 150 strands a day. So it, it is normal to lose some hair during the day, and, and many of us might not notice that. Um, and no one's going to actually catch out, right? But, you know, if it's significant, um, that is uh, typically can be related to those hormonal changes. So there's many, 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 there is a lot of options um, for hair loss and hair thinning. Um, there, there are some women who do choose to see dermatologists, and, and for many women, losing their hair is devastating. It's part of their identity, and it makes them feel much more like themselves. And so hair can be a, a reason people might want to take a medication. So there's a medication called, which your cardiologist might prescribe, is called spironolactone or aldactone, and sometimes people will prescribe that for hair. Uh, finasteride is also a medication. It's a it's a prostate medication can also be used for hair. Over the counter, though, women can try something like Rogaine foam for women. And also biotin and zinc can be very helpful. So you can get biotin, zinc, or Rogaine over the counter. You can have your doctor check those levels, but they're also simply safe to take. Um, if you go on Amazon, a lot of my patients will, um, you know, just look up, you know, hair and what's really in those is biotin and, and zinc and sometimes iron. Um, so those can also be really helpful. Hormone therapy is good for your hair. It's not FDA approved for your hair, but if you've got one other indication in there, osteopenia, some night sweats, some insomnia, some vaginal dryness, estrogen is good for hair. And uh, I have many patients who take it to, who, who, who really do, do, do take it for their hair. Um, again, it's not FDA approved for that, but you can often find an FDA indication. There is other medications and there is dermatologists now working on injectables and hair transplants. Um, I know they're working on devices like hair wands and things like that, that we should be looking to see like in the future. But it is common to lose that your hair postmenopausal. It is devastating for many women. Even if you have a lot of hair, um, you know, sometimes doctors will dismiss that and say, well, you, you look like you have a lot of hair. And, and someone can say they, you know, bring in a picture and they had twice as much hair as before. So it can be really uh, a, 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 an issue. But again, start with, you know, talking to your doctor. You could try over-the-counter biotin, um, Rogaine foam for women, um, any of those like hair vitamins, that's what's going to be in them. And then, of course, there are some treatments that you'd want to talk to your doctor about. Great. Okay. I'm, I'm looking at the chat and I think there's maybe confusion or maybe I'm confused. Estrogen cream. So estrogen can be taken orally by mouth 
it can be used as a patch or a topical on the skin with the intention of it being absorbed into your body. But the vaginal estrogen cream is not absorbed systemically. So when people talk about estrogen cream, that's not for osteoporosis. That's not for hair loss. That's not for anything except for the vaginal dryness and atrophy, right? Absolutely. So if... Absolutely. And that's a really important distinction. So there are FDA approved a systemic estrogen. So again, you want to avoid, this is an, a good reason and a good point to, to talking point about avoiding compounded estrogens. So you want to use only FDA approved estrogen. So um, there's Eva Mist, which is a spray. There's Diva Gel, which is a gel that I commonly prescribe. And for those systemic estrogens, you're just kind of rubbing it somewhere meaty like your arm. A lot of times I have my patients put it on their thighs. Anytime estrogen is going in the vagina, if it's FDA approved, if it's Vagifem, Estrace, um, those are only for the vagina and they're not going to go systemically. So it's helpful to, to clarify with your doctor if there's a confusion. Um, um, yeah, that's just a great question in, in the sense that I, I bet patients are often con sometimes confused if, if their doctor didn't write to prescribe, uh, explain it carefully. But, but yes, if you're taking a cream and you're applying it to like your leg or your arm, that's systemic. If you're applying it to the vagina, it's probably just vaginal only and it's not going systemically. Great. It's kind of easier if I know like the names of what, you know, if you said the name, a, a doctor should know. Um, but, but that's an important distinction. Okay, great. It's such a nice overview for us. So I typed in there the estrogen, the menopause.org as a reference because there's a number of questions it looks like in the chat about some of the specific side effects and some of the non-hormonal therapies. Um, Dr. Hirsch, are, are those kind of uh, laid out on the, that website too? Is that a good resource that we should be directing these questions? Yes, yes. The, the menopause.org website is, is, is great. Um, there is a lot of set, a lot, a lot of information out there. I actually just opened up the chat too. Let me see if I can quickly go through these two. Um, is Osfina safer than other hormonal treatment is a great question. So Osfina does carry a, the same risk of blood clot, um, which is about one in a thousand or one to two, one in 2000 as a hormonal treatment. It does not carry um, the same type of risk uh, if you're uh, past 10 years of menopause for uh, cancer and for uh, cardiovascular. So it is, I guess, safer. Um, but again, they're both pretty safe. So it's really what's what you think is right for you. Vaginal estrogen can be extremely costly and it's absolutely terrible. I, I know um, another option for whoever uh, mentioned the vaginal estrogen is costly is there is a new, a new option called Invixi. Invixi can be, uh, Invixi is a little, I call it the jelly bean. It looks like a jelly bean actually, and it's a lot less messy. And I think it's about 20, eight dollars a month it's a little bit cheaper than the other vaginal estrogen when i have time to march in washington about how crazy expensive vaginal estrogen is i will it is is awful another uh, uh listener wrote my biggest concern is waking up many times hormone therapy is not the only option um but oftentimes can help so a good journal will help as well thank you for um all of your nice comments um and uh, uh, I hope that was really helpful to, to everyone who is listening in today. Thank you. Actually, we'll, we'll sneak in one more real quick question, which is, um, is chronic weight loss, loss of hunger related to menopause? And then we'll end on that one. Yeah, great question. So, you know, I think any symptom that a patient has at or around menopause is definitely noteworthy. Most women gain weight at menopause. The metabolism usually shifts to where women start to gain weight. Um, if you are experiencing weight loss, though, it, it, it might not be the most common, but if you're you know, experiencing increasing worry or anxiety and your tendency when you have any of those symptoms is to not eat, you know, probably digging deeper into why. If it's simply just a loss of satiety or a loss of hunger, I would talk to your doctor because that could be a lot of things. Um, 
so, you know, again, a good journal might help you really see or dig into what's causing that loss of appetite. Perhaps you're worrying about your parents, your children, COVID, you know, and, and that could be a reason. It's, it's really hard to say. Perfect. Okay. On behalf of the Lound Group and all of our patients, thank you so much, Heather, and it's wonderful to see you again, and we will definitely come find you for our next installment. And thanks to everyone in the audience for your great questions and your attention. And everyone, take care. Have a wonderful day. Thank you guys for having me. Bye-bye.